Hello and good afternoon uh, on this Saturday afternoon. Uh, we are here with another installment of our conversation series. And I'm very glad to be joined by Councilman Hamblin and also our uh, guest speaker, Professor Patrick Miller from uh, Department of Political Sciences of University of Kansas. Uh, we are very glad that Dr. Miller accepted our invitation to um, enlighten us with some uh, uh, topics about uh, transparency and the function of the government. Thank you very much, Patrick, for giving us your time on this Saturday afternoon. Sure. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott, like always. Well, I and Scott don't need to thank each other. We are the partners in this. <laughs> so, uh, basically, uh, in order to just introduce Dr. Miller, I'm going to ask him himself to uh, introduce his background and uh, research and some of the fantastic stuff that he does at the political sciences at KU. And then we have a few questions from Dr. Miro. Before we start, I just want to make sure that everybody who watches this uh, uh, installment of a conversation series understands that Dr. Miller is here purely as an academician, as a scholar in the area of political sciences, and he's providing his uh, uh, expertise and knowledge just in the spirit of the general discussion and uh, we wanted to make sure that that's well understood uh, he's not here to either prove our point of view or not prove our point of view it's just we wanted a, a scholar uh, authority to provide us with some definitions that then we could work with eventually if that is uh, that's the reason that he uh, very uh, graciously accepted our invitation. So, Dr. Miller, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and what you do at, up there at Lawrence. Okay, um, I'm probably not that interesting. Um, background, so I'm from Virginia originally by way of Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, then ultimately here. Um, KU hired me in 2013, so I've been in Kansas about seven years now. Um, Generally, what I do is I study American politics. I teach about research American politics. Uh, in terms of research, my particular emphasis is uh, the psychology of politics. I'm actually a political psychologist. So uh, if anyone follows me on Twitter, I don't actually tweet about my research very much. Um, but most of what I do in uh, my own research is using surveys and experiments to um, understand the psychology of the way people think about politics and act about politics in all kinds of interesting, at least interesting to me, areas. Um, outside of that, I, I dabble in following Kansas politics, not actually what I research. I, I tweet about that more, um, particularly, and I think when I came to Kansas, um, you know, it's not a state that I... Uh, had really spent any time in or had super intimate knowledge of, so I wanted to get to know the state more. Um, so in addition to just you know going around in Kansas, visiting places, I started to try to understand the political nature of Kansas and look at a lot of data about Kansas politics. Um, so I think that you know for those who might follow me on Twitter, that's a lot of what I put out there. You know things I learned through looking at the state through kind of a quantitative approach, uh, polling, the electoral landscape in Kansas. Um, so that's basically, you know, how I spend my work and free time is uh, geeking out on politics and doing research that would probably be really boring for me to talk about here. Uh, but it's interesting to me. Very cool. Councilman Hamblin, do you have any Okay, so now I'm going to start. That's fantastic. I mean, I think political psychology is, is really an amazing field, actually, these days. You are kind of discounting it a little bit, but if you could predict the psychology of the people who go to the polls, you, you know, could really basically look into the outcomes of election from another perspective. And I really think that that cascades down all the way from federal to even local government. When we look at why constituents voted the way they do, 
and what lessons exist in them to learn. I believe that's, uh, that's amazing. So I want to start our conversation, if, it, if I may, with asking you to define the, the meaning of transparency in government for us from the perspective of a scholar. And uh, this show, as you know, we are going to talk about transparency in government. So what is, what do, how do you define transparency in government or a government that merits as being transparent? Well, I think to me, that means a government that is open to citizens and accessible. Um, and, and I think, you know, not just in America, but in other democracies over the last several centuries, the nature of democracy has changed towards being more participatory, more inclusive, and more transparent. I mean, our founders gave us a political system that has worked for over 200 years and has evolved in many ways, but they also gave us a political system at the time that was in many ways very elitist and very closed because there was a relatively small number of citizens who could actually participate in politics. Many of our founders were very resistant to the idea of um, average citizens actually voting on anything. Uh, some of them only very reluctantly agreed for example, that we should be allowed to vote for the House of Representatives, but certainly not vote for President or, or Senate, which we couldn't at the time. Um, and I think if I were to take you back to their era, transparency meant freedom of the press, um, which was something that they did have an interest in safeguarding. Of course, the press was very different um, at that time. But at least in the American context, we have evolved to be a more participatory democracy. The press has evolved in many ways. Um, and also government has expanded in terms of the number of governments that we have. I mean, think of you have local government, state government, school boards, and so on and so forth. And also the scope of what government does has expanded in a lot of ways. So I think that particularly in the post-World War II period, um, transparency in the United States has meant making the inner workings of government be more open and accessible to the public. If you think of things like the Freedom of Information Act, for example, or um, instituting laws that require tracking campaign finance for the first time, I think those would be excellent uh, examples of transparency. Though I think of course like like any virtue in government, there are limits to that, that you could ar normatively argue should exist and that the courts have even said should exist. Uh, you know, for example, um, I know we're talking about local government a lot here, but a, a prime example would be uh, that the government can keep a lot of secrets when it comes to defense, for example, and that that's in the national interest. So that might be an area where we would say that you can actually be too transparent. And I think that you can have a legitimate debate at every level of government about uh, how transparency can work in a way that facilitates government working efficiently uh, and doesn't inhibit it, but that also works with the regular job of representation that people like you all uh, engage in through uh, meetings with your constituents and having public forums, being accessible via email, social media, and so forth. So long answer to your, to your question. Uh, but I think, again, for me, the core is openness and accessibility uh, is how I would define transparency. Excellent. So main pillars of it being openness and accessibility. Councilman Hamblin, do you have a question you want to run right now? Well, I don't know um, where you're kind of... Um, Heading with your next questions, Dr. Fursadi, and I don't want to get ahead, get ahead of you there. No, but, go ahead. Uh, well, I'll just adjust uh, my question based on what you might have. Oh, uh, well, the, you know, you mentioned you're a, a political psychologist, which I think is fascinating. Um, that seems like a very interesting topic. And so my question, I guess, is we, transparency is something we hear a lot about right now. Um, it's it's talked about at all levels of the government, whether it be a lot of the things you talked about or whether you know, it expands into the inner workings and decision-making and how those processes came about um, um, to even go that deep into government. But from your perspective, from your expertise, uh, 
do you get do you have any feeling of maybe where the future of transparency might be headed uh i mean i think that really depends on what area of what level of government you're talking about and also what area of government that you're talking right. about i think there are some areas where our democracy is becoming less transparent, other areas where it's becoming more transparent. So an area where we might be becoming less transparent, I think an excellent example of that would be campaign finance, um, particularly if you think about post Citizens United um, and Supreme Court rulings and federal legislation that have actually injected a lot more money into politics, but have made it impossible to track a lot of that money. So there's a lot of money being spent today to influence elected officials and voters that we have no idea where the money came from, um, nor do political actors often have any incentive to disclose that money if, if they do know. So we call it dark money oftentimes. Right. Um, I think another, one area where government might be becoming more transparent is actually at the local level in the United States. Um, or I think just you know, anecdotally looking around, I mean, not just Kansas, but elsewhere, you do see local government kept, catching up, I think, technologically with um, its ability to be more accessible to citizens in terms of uh, broadcasting council or, or commission meetings to the public, which I think that you, you all do in Overland Park. Uh, I, I do know that about Overland Park politics. Um, I think some of your, your council members a few years back, um, I'm not sure if you, you, you both were on the council at the time, um, pushed to, to make that something that Overland Park did. Um, and so that might be an example. Um, but I think, you know, you do see examples of that in the local level throughout the country where uh, maybe necessarily in the past, local government hasn't done much with putting documents online or broadcasting meetings or televising meetings. Um, but I think there certainly is a trend in that direction. Um, whether or not citizens actually access those things, I think is a different question, but at least right. the ability to access them uh, is an area where I think transparency is growing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So the, is there, we have in different layers of government, we have different models which are applied, like not all state uh, legislatures function the same or not local governments are structured even in the same way. And is there a certain structure of the government that is more friendly to transparency and or it, this, it, these are all a function of the individuals who are running that government? Because if you, when you look at the structure of any government, there is a administration, there is a technical group of people, and then there is the elected officials. And they, basically these two combine in that government with decisions which are made and how much relationship you have with the people and who stands behind the decisions. So I wanted to ask you if there is a pattern of there, there is a, you know, a unique characteristics that we could research a government under that magnifying glass to see inherently because of this structure, this uh, would be very friendly or not so friendly to transparency? Or do you think majority of it falls on the shoulder of individuals who are in those posts, so to speak? Is the question clear or? Um, I think so. I mean, I think it very much depends on what level of government you're talking about, what branch of government you're talking about. Um, a lot of people, for example, might be very familiar with the federal government. Um, you know, one trend that we have seen since Richard Nixon, presidents of both parties increasingly invoking executive privilege or other um, kinds of rationales that go to court, um, but they invoke those to try to protect documents from becoming publicly accessible. Or uh, there's been an increasing trend of um, marking documents as classified or secrets really secret really in the last 40 years so i think in the executive branch of the federal government we actually have a trend towards less openness in the sense that administrations again of both parties have, have really acted to make their inner workings less public uh, in many ways i think compare that to congress where in many ways that's become a lot more public with 
committee hearings or the floor being broadcast. Um, you know, of course, with the legislative branch, I think much like a city council or a state legislature, the real work of government often does not happen in front of the camera. It happens with discussions behind the scenes over or coffee or a drink or dinner between members of an elected body or members and uh, community uh, members with their elected officials, um, you know, talking about what's going on in government. And I think that's where a lot of the persuasion of elected officials goes on. If you want to try and change an elected official's mind, you do that in a one-on-one -on -one conversation that's not necessarily going to be broadcast to the public. Um, and you might argue that's a good thing because I think a lot of us, if we're going to change our minds, we don't necessarily, you know, to some extent, I think that often involves saying that you're wrong. And that is something that we might be less tempted to do if those proceedings are public. So, you know, I think just a lot of the work of deliberation in government occurs in places where we can't necessarily see it. Um, there are pros and cons to that, obviously. Um, courts are a whole other thing. I mean, courts have to explain themselves to the public, although we're not in the chambers with the judges. Um, I think if you look at the state and local level in the, in the U.S., um, that is really where you have laws about transparency, I think, much less consistent, less widespread, less institutionalized. And so the way that like the Kansas legislature or a city commission in, Lor in, in Lawrence or Ovo and Park or anywhere in Kansas are going to behave might be very different from the next state over. And I think at that level, there is a lot more room for personalities uh, to become involved. Um, so I think about our Kansas legislature, for example, and I think one of the greatest sources of transparency for what's happening in the legislature is actually some of the individual members who are tweeting about what's happening at meetings where we would otherwise have no way of knowing what's happening there or tweeting about what's happening on the floor um, to give us a lot deeper context to what's happening. So I think in that context, individuals can certainly play a much more prominent role uh, and certainly in local government as, as well. I may have veered away from the original part of your question. Uh, no, I think that's the, you answered it. I just wanted to know if there is a certain structure which allows more transparency versus less transparency or is it majority based on characteristics of who takes the office, so yeah. to speak. And you, are, you mentioned it very well that in, in the lower level of government, there is more flexibility, so to speak. Yeah, and I would also say that when you get to state and local government, the laws are going to vary a lot more as as well. Um, I think there are some state governments in the US that are that do better with transparency matters, um, where there are laws in place that force more documents to be public or force better and easier access to campaign finance data, for example. And there are some states, and I think Kansas often traditionally has been marked down on this, where the laws are not as aggressive as enforcing government to actively put things out for the public to consume. So the role of law at the state, at the state, local, at state level, and particularly how that affects localities is also very important. Excellent. Scott, do you have a question now? Um, not really. I mean, you kind of touched on, on the laws and how Kansas has been marked down. I, I guess one of my question is obviously things are going to differ from state to state but let's say we're talking local government and we're talking within the state let's say we're talking about Olathe and Topeka or something um, and I don't think there's probably much of a debate that when you talk about different cities you're probably going to see different levels of transparency um, I mean am, am I correct I mean the law might not require it but are some of these cities going above and beyond what the law requires to, to, to be more transparent than maybe, you know, a, the, the city next door, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly you see that in every state. I mean, not just Kansas, right. that every, every city has its own, or county has its own unique political culture. And there's also a unique dynamic among the people um, on every elected body. So you may get one city commission where, um, 
you know, people act in a very collegial, chummy manner and a lot of the, the work of government. And I don't, I don't say that, you know, in a, in a negative way. I mean, it just being maybe very friendly and a lot of the work of government, a lot of the, of the deliberation could happen in one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's just not a culture of putting things out there as much for better or worse. That's not necessarily a nefarious thing. Um, you may have a different commission where the culture is just to be more public, where, you know, mem members of a commission or, or a council just might be um, more tepid about having off the record conversations. Um, and I think certainly if you have an elected body where there are more contentious relationships between members of that body, that that can often be something that while it may not always be good for the functioning of that of that council or commission, can can force things to be public, if there is some kind of internal pressure to uh, to open things up in a way that maybe they haven't been in the past. Whether that's you know saying that this meeting needs to be public rather than held in private, or there needs to be citizen input in some kind of decision in some way when there might not be otherwise, or or televising meetings. Uh, so I think there's a lot of a lot of dynamics that can be unique to a particular community and a particular elected body that can lead to different outcomes above and beyond what the state requires. Sure. Good. Great. That's uh, I think, uh, yeah, exactly that, what I was asking. Of, is what, that's, yeah, you, that's a, that was a great uh, lead that we had. But uh, just you basically went to the, my next question, and I just wanted to ask you is that in general, like, as, again, we are a little bit more focused on local government here in terms of our conversation, but some of the rules I believe apply. Do you believe that transparency helps a government to function better? Do you think that, the, again, there are maybe certain things that are prohibited by law to be public, but when the prohibition by law doesn't exist for majority of the rest, which is a lot of cases in local government, a lot of situations in local government, there is absolutely no law which mandates you to be, to be, uh, you know, closed to the public. Do you believe that a transparent government, by nature, could function better, or you think there is no correlation necessarily between transparency and functioning in, in this year of 2020 and this in this DNA DNA? I mean, honestly, I think the answer is that it depends. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can probably all agree that transparency, just as a broad word, is a good thing. Is. But what does that mean, right? And what does that mean in a particular area? So, for example, I'm of the mind that the more transparency that you have in campaign finance, the better. Um, I don't see a downside to making whether it's at the local level, we're talking about you know, local government in Johnson County or the super PACs that operate at the federal government, I don't see a downside to saying that we need to document the money that's in politics, uh, that's spent in campaigns and spent in lobbying, and that that can make government better. I don't see the downside to that. Um, I do see a possible downside to something like you know, televising. Uh, events. I, I think that a lot of, I mean, let me give you an example from the federal government. I, I think that a lot of people who study Congress will say that as awesome as it was that we got C-SPAN, in some ways it has made Congress a significantly less functional institution because, you know, particularly with putting committee hearings, like committee hearings are where a lot of the real work of Congress happened you know, behind the scenes conversations. The floor is all, you know, pro forma formalities. But I think that a lot of people who study Congress will say that when committees got put on TV, you change the incentives of members of Congress. Whereas before that, the incentive was, let me invest myself in the committee work and really engage in the conversation we're having here, ask questions of witnesses and so on. The incentive changed to one of political theater, where now the goal of the committee meeting is just to score points, to make statements, not ask questions. I mean, politicians being politicians, no offense, um, have different motives and different goals. So I, I think, you know, that is something that can, can go both ways. And I, that's been a big concern with putting 
court proceedings on, on air, for example. So I think that's a good example of something where there can be a pro, but there can be a con. Um, you know, whether the same concerns pan out at the local government, city council, you know, I'm not really sure. I haven't heard a lot of people criticizing the, the Lawrence or the Overland Park City Commissions because you're now on TV and you're all just playing theater now. Uh, not something I've heard. Uh, but you can imagine how that could change how people act. Um, you know, I, I think with putting documents out, certainly I don't see a, a downside of that. I mean, some people might think that transparency means involving citizens in the process. And certainly, it, I mean, to an extent that does, we still have representative democracy where it's you all making the decisions. Um, you know, citizens have the opportunity, obviously, to offer their input to their elected officials. Um, but I think that local government can structure that input in ways that either help or hinder um, the policy process um, or the efficiency of meetings. So I, I guess I would say that more transparency is not always necessarily a good thing if it's structured in a way where it actually keeps you from accomplishing the goals that you want to accomplish, uh, even if transparency is a good thing. So I think we have to think about how we can open up government and be accessible in a way that still makes government work. Absolutely. Um, what um, you, you kind of mentioned the, the, the public and input, just um, I guess out of curiosity from your opinion, what do you think just even, uh, you know, like when the public feels they have a say, when they feel someone's listening, um, and we'll just roll that into transparency. Is that, uh, do you think that has a, a value, uh, a, a, an effect on people on how they feel about their, the, the trust and faith in their local government? Uh, yes, I mean, interestingly, I think it cuts both ways. I think um, people, I mean, there's a lot of very interesting research over time with both state government and, and federal government where uh, ignorance in many ways is bliss. Uh, interestingly, we trust more, we, tr we tend in America to trust government more the less we know about government and the less we follow it. But, and then the more we get invested in it, usually because we're angry about something uh, or elections, the less we trust it. Um, and just interestingly, it's, 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 it's this fascinating trend where we're always less likely to trust Congress than we are a president. Uh, and a lot of people who research that point to the fact that the fighting in Congress or the disagreement, which is kind of its job, uh, makes people trust it less because instead of being an institution that acts efficiently, it fights, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, so, you know, I don't necessarily think that if you just opened up all the workings of government uh, 100% to the public that we're just gonna trust government more because in some ways the political process, uh, it's contentious and that can be a turn off. Um, it involves deal making by nature and that can be a turn off. Uh, but we certainly do want people to feel like they have a voice and they have influence in the process. Um, you know, which is why I think it's a good thing that a lot of elected officials are accessible via email, via social media. So that, that can be a way that uh, people can voice their opinion if they so choose. It's obviously a good thing to have meetings be, uh, you know, council meetings, for example, or commission meetings be open to the public and have some opportunity for the public to offer input in some way either before a meeting or during a meeting, you know, you still have to get the business done of the meeting in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so I think all of those things can help people feel more efficacious, but I think we need to realize that when people are investing themselves in government, for better or worse, it's often because they're angry about something or they're upset about something. So that process needs to be structured in a way that can help people both vent and feel that their concerns are being heard and that they can understand the ultimate outcome of political processes. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that's, that's understandable. I would agree with that. Most, you know, most people that say, I'm gonna call my council member is doing that because 
they need something. They're upset about something. Mm -hmm. um, not just because they went, I really like this. I'm going to call my council member and say, Hey, great job. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of, that's just the nature of the job. Uh, opposition and negativity motivates a lot of, a lot of citizen participation in politics. Um, it's why we tend to, to, to contact our elected officials, which is why I will never run for office because I don't <laughs> want to bear the brunt of getting 50 emails a day about people being angry about something. I'm, I'm glad that there are people like you who want that job. Um, <laughs> You know, negativity is a huge reason of why we vote these days. I mean, we're more motivated to go out and just beat the other party than we are to support our party. So, yeah, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to deal with that in a healthy way that lets that input be expressed and that lets people understand ultimately how that input was factored in, which is why people like you all, you know, giving your rationales in public, uh, or why your decisions are being made. Responding to emails is critical. Um, and, you know, ultimately, if transparency helps people understand in the end, you know, I didn't win on this, I didn't get policy the way I wanted it, but at least I can understand how the outcome happened, then that's a good thing. Right. Fantastic. What I wrote down here is that it has to be structured in a way that people could provide input and also they could see how that input was factored in. Because if it breaks down at any of those two levels, that dissatisfaction stays there. Sometimes you don't get what you wanted, but at least you know that they paid attention to what you say. But when you don't even pay attention to what they say, then there is no way that there would be any element of satisfaction. And I compare what you said to simply doctors in the hospital. Nobody comes to the hospital to say, hey, I'm really happy and healthy and, you know, I am doing really great. I just did 200 push-ups today and I'm going to go swim two miles. Usually they come when there is something wrong. And we elected officials who signed up for this, I think, I believe we should just view it from that perspective that any communication is a right. task for us to go after something. But to be perfectly honest with you, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, Dr. Miller, I have had communication without anything, just saying good job, which I'm extremely grateful. And it feel, makes me feel okay. really good. Yeah. Really oh, yeah. good. Right. Those, are, uh, those are the emails that'll turn your day around for sure. Right. <laughs> but you know, I think your point is an important one because I think a lot, I, mean, I think in some ways we're getting a little bit of, I mean, transparency into representation I and mean, representation is part of transparency. Um, you know, ultimately what government both represents the public and then factors all that representation through you all's decision-making skills into some ultimate outcome. Um, so, you know, you can, you can fold representation into that, but I think a lot of the job of investing citizens in politics, making them feel like their voice is heard, falls on elected officials. And it's not necessarily something that government policy or the way that government works can always necessarily do. So the main point of input for most citizens in theory is going to be you all, council members, state legislators, and so on. And that's their point of interaction rather than some anonymous comment box on a city council page necessarily. Mm -hmm. So that interaction with a council member, you know, you reading their email, responding to it, even if you're saying, well, I disagree with you, but I appreciate your, your, your opinion being expressed. Uh, and, and the way that you talk in public about, you know, this is what people who contacted me said in their concerns and engage with that. I mean, you don't have to agree with it. If you differ from that, I think that's something people be very interested in hearing. So I think, again, you know, a lot of that falls on the individual elected official uh, and not just government necessarily. How does that influence the relationship between government and the media? So, you know, one level of transparency, as you elegantly uh, explained, is the constituent and the elected official, basically, which your existence as an elected official, somebody who was elected, is a level of inherent transparency, because otherwise, in the societies that we don't have that, that avenue is closed. But another important portion of it comes on, in my humble opinion, comes on media. And how would you... Uh, can you please elaborate on that, like transparency in government as a characteristics and the relationship with the, with the media? 
Sure. Um, and I think in many ways, if, if I were to resurrect some of our founders, that that would probably be how they thought of transparency exactly. at their time. Um, you know, when, when, our, when our founders created American government, uh, you know, it was long before this 20th century notion of a professional media that was nonpartisan ever happened. You know, we, we functioned for over 100 years in this country with media explicitly based in political parties. Um, and that was the culture of our media. I think in some ways we've come back to that on um, both the left and right uh, in recent years. Um, but I think in American democracy, which is different from a lot of democracies, the relationship between media and government is fundamentally and by nature contentious. Um, there are a lot of countries in the world where you have state supported media, where the job of the media is to parrot the government talking points and not question that at all. Whereas in America, it has always been the job of media, whether it's partisan media or professional media, always been the job to challenge the government and force the government to be more open and to explain things that the government might, might not otherwise want to be explained. Um, and I think that's a very unique thing about the history of media in American democracy compared to a lot of countries. Um, and also why a lot of the transparency laws that we have seen in the United States at the state and the federal level, I think have been around the issue of media access. Uh, so you think of something like the Freedom of Information Act, for example, uh, it was really something that in many ways came about to deal with media access to things that the government otherwise wasn't making public. So, you know, the, the media is incredibly important, uh, always has been. Uh, if you recognize that this was never intended to be a, a get along or go along relationship, it was always intended to be a hostile one. Uh, in fact, I think sometimes in America, our media are not hostile enough towards government. Uh, that's a whole other debate. Um, British reporters, uh, some of my favorite uh, favorites in, in the world, uh, they just, the level of disrespect that they show to their elected officials uh, is both engrossing and kind of, you have to admire it at, at some points. I mean, and refreshing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, like in, in America, I mean, I think some reporters do better than, than others, but like in America, I think a lot of our press has this habit of asking the question, the elected official says something that doesn't really answer the question and then you don't get the follow-up question. Whereas I think in other countries, you know, Britain again being a great one, the culture is to change, uh, follow that aggressively. You know, press, well, you really need to answer my question in a way that we don't really get in America. Uh, so in some ways, I, I wish we had more, a more aggressive press to force more accountability, force transparency. Um, but I think one of the worrisome things in America in recent decades has been the decline of press at the state and local level. Uh, we have fewer media outlets today covering state capitals and local government than really we have at any point in the post-World War II period if you look at government, if you, if you look at the country nationally. I mean, certainly some communities are, are, are doing better at that. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's where things like, I think about, you know, Johnson County where something like the Shawnee Mission Post, which is a, a local news outlet, um, you know, startups like that, we're starting to see more of that around the country. Those, those are a very good thing uh, for transparency because they're community focused um, and they provide a degree of coverage that might otherwise be absent. So, you know, the press is critical. We need more of it. And I think if anything, those relationships need to be more contentious. Absolutely. Absolutely. Scott, do you have any questions left? Um, no, not at the moment. I'm one last question, if Scott doesn't come up with a, another question, and thank you very much. It's about an hour of your time on Saturday evening. Uh, oh. How does know. that, how does facing a transparent government, so okay, let's, let's put two models next to each other and compare it. The model number one is that people come and they provide an input, okay? And without any 
real in reason, their government tells them that, well, no, no, sorry, not going to happen, basically. And there is, just like you said, it's not the British model. They don't get to chew at it, to really say, okay, if you are saying why, provide me with a reason. One of the concepts, Dr. Miller, that I'm really interested in is evidence-based government. In the same manner that we have evidence-based medicine, that if we could have an evidence-based government, and there is a limited level of information if you search on the web on it, that is a government that always has a level of research and evidence for the decisions that it makes, basically, for almost everything. Because a lot of answers exist in science these days for decisions to be made. So what I'm saying is that if we compare two models, model number one, there are input provided by the citizens, and then this input doesn't get anywhere. And in the model two, the input is provided, and the input, just like you said, gets to somewhere, although that somewhere may or may not be what people want. Do you think these two models influence the psychology of the voter? We are circling back to your expertise. Otherwise, do you think that would influence, we know that in local election, it's like the, the rate of the voting is about 10, 11 percent, 8 to 6 to 8, 10, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that could play a factor to the interest of the people to even be involved in local and maybe even state elections? But again, one more time, we are mostly talking about local government here. When they see that their input, I, if, they're, if what they wanted to happen was rejected, they were given a reason for it. The, the reason was not that, well, well, you spoke and I don't feel like it. I, I think that the process, the processes that you're talking about, and I think more so how representation is performed by elected officials are really what's key there, right? I mean, I think it's important to recognize that as citizens, right, we're, we, you know, we, we, we live in a democracy. A republic is a kind of democracy. They're not different things. Uh, uh, in a republic, though, it's not a direct democracy. In a direct democracy, we're all going out just voting on so it's a ballot initiative, right? Or something like how ancient Athens was. In a republic, we elect people to make decisions for us because in theory, it's more efficient. You can be more informed, have more evidence, um, which I wish elected officials made more evidence-based decisions, but I know how politics works, um, for better or worse. Um, but you know, as, as citizens, I think it is, we can reasonably have an expectation that there should be an outlet for us to voice our opinions if we so choose and ultimately to vote to change government if we so choose. Uh, I think there is a reasonable expectation that our elected officials should engage with that input, uh, engage with us individually, you know, give their rationales in public, obviously, um, though certainly we don't have a right to necessarily win as citizens, right? I mean, just because we have voiced our input, that does not mean that that input necessarily should then dictate how you all decide, right? I mean, if you all are just going to take the temperature of a room, then you all really don't serve a purpose. I mean, we might as well then just have everything be a public vote. Um, and quite frankly, you know, if we all just listen to public opinion, if we had listened to public opinion, we never would have ended segregation in the United States because public opinion was against that. Yet our elected officials and our courts decided that that was a good thing. Um, so there is definitely the role for public opinion. Um, and I think that as citizens, we should demand more from our elected officials to listen to that, but also to give us feedback to say that, you know, in the email, engage with what I said, rather than just saying, well, thanks for sending your opinion, right? Uh, to tell me why you disagree with me, if, if that's what's happening there. Or, you know, to give reasons in public to say, well, this is what people said, but I have to balance it against these interests over here or this goal that maybe is not as much on the public's mind. Um, you know, you all can perform the job of looking two, three, four steps down the road, where I think oftentimes as citizens, we're just looking at, at what's right in front of our faces. 
Um, so there is that role for you all to make decisions, but I think as citizens, we should reasonably expect that you're going to explain those. Um, and certainly if you don't, then we can feel more alienated from government. You know, if, if I don't have an elected official who uh, has any kind of social media presence, I might feel like that person isn't interested in what I have to say. If I'm not getting a newsletter, if my elected official isn't holding meetings um, in their district or, or community, then I might feel more alienated if I'm aware of those things. Um, so, you know, going to what you say, you know, the way that you all act as elected officials can feed back on the public, I think in more ways than you might appreciate. Um, and the nature of that feedback, even if it's to say, I think you're wrong, um, can actually invest us as citizens more if we feel like you're at least willing to listen to us. So let me see if, I, if my conclusion from your statement would be agreeable by you, is that the minimum that you could do is to enter to a discussion with your constituents. The minimum that we, you could do is to open the door for a discussion even if you disagree with them. Uh, not entering to a dis even to a discussion, well, uh, about majority of the cases at least. If somebody says something illegal, you know, at least you could say it's illegal. But minimum that an elected official could commit to is entering to a level of discussion. The discussion could be just a reply to an email or could be a 10 minute discussion in the city hall. But that is the minimum that would needs to be performed. Is that, do you agree with that? Well, for a minimum, I think you could, you could lower the, board, the, the floor even further. I'd rather have an elected official who reads their emails and never answers <laughs> than an elected official who never reads their emails, right? Um, yeah. It'd be great if that elected official could go the next step up and engage with me. If, if I express my opinion. Now, that doesn't mean you have to write a 1,000 word essay in right. response to what I say, right? But yeah. representation is fundamentally a back and forth between constituents and elected officials. And so it's gonna work better if you all give that feedback. Um, all of that said, right? I think you, we can still engage in a debate if we can say that, we want good representation where there is this back and forth. We want the public to have input. We can have a debate about how that can best be structured, right? Like, uh, you know, some, some communities, um, when they have meetings on contentious topics, you have, you know, there's often a debate. Well, how should that meeting be structured? How long should people have to talk? Should they be, should, should, uh, input be on a certain topic or it should it be wide ranging, right? Now, all those decisions are not necessarily going to be equally conducive to the most voices being heard and that meeting being efficiently run and a decision being efficiently come to. So you can have a debate about that, but I think at minimum we could all recognize that the opportunity to voice ourselves via email or at a meeting or some other way is critical. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Councilman Hamblin, do you have any other questions or? No, no more questions. I, I, I really appreciate uh, your time. I think it's fascinating what you do. And um, um, yeah, I, I, I hope we get to hear more from you soon. Well, That's sure. Well, thank thanks for having me. Dr. Miller, any closing comments? Anything else? Uh, no. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I, I guess what I, what, I, what I always say about you know opportunities to interact with this is that the people who are going to pay attention to this are the people who are already vested in politics, right? It's, it's the people who they're aware, they're knowledgeable, they geek out on what you all are doing, um, and I think you know not only for you all but for anyone who might be you know watching watching this, you know, just remember that you know the way that you. The, the way that you talk about government and politics influences those of us, influences everyone else who isn't as vested, right? So if, uh, if you want people to be more active, it's the job of citizens, professors, the media, elected officials to try to vest people as much as possible, right? Tell people what's good, what could be different, and tell people about ways that they do have to, to influence their government. So... 
you know, the average listener to this, you still play a really critical role in the health of our democracy because the way you talk to your friends and families about what the challenges are, what's good and what their opportunities to give input are, are gonna be really critical to shaping how everyone who's not watching this views Overland Park government or American government. So I think that's the only thing that I would add. Excellent, fantastic. So basically, we are at some level as elected officials, we should also take upon ourselves as educators to show people the avenues existing for them to express their point of view. And basically we should be champions of inviting people in, if I, if I heard you right, and truthfully telling them the mechanisms that exist for them to express their point of view and you know, constantly welcome them to this discussion, basically. Is that? Yeah. I mean, you all are elected representatives, right? I mean, each of you is going to have, you know, just like every member of Congress has their own idea of what they represent, who they represent, how they should conduct themselves in that enterprise. You know, and it's not my place to judge that, right? There are people who, there are, people who are elected to office who see, who think that the only people they were ever elected to represent are the people who agree with them or the people who are mobilized around one certain issue, right? Versus there are others who genuinely want the disagreement, right? I mean, I'm not going to say one of those is better or worse, but at minimum as representatives, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good if you do point out, like if, if, if it's your, if it's my job to represent you, here's how you contact me. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to agree with you. I'm not necessarily going to follow what you say because I have a lot more to balance in addition to just how the winds are blowing. Uh, but making yourself publicly accessible, I think, is is part of the job. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I trust that all restaurants are open in Lawrence at this point, right? There is, if you wanted to go grab dinner tonight, you could somewhere. Uh, well, if I didn't have things I could just reheat in the refrigerator, I, I might <laughs> consider it, right? Thank you. I appreciate uh, it, Dr. Miller. I always uh, listen to your commentaries and enjoy them. And I'm very grateful for this hour of your time on Saturday afternoon. And we hope to see you soon in one of our other installments of our conversation series. And thank you so much and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, thank you for having me. And, and nice to meet you as well. Yeah, Bye, you too. But nice to meet you. <laughs> All right, bye. All right, Councilman Hamblin. So that was Dr. Patrick Miller from Department of Political Sciences of the University of Kansas, providing some uh, general concepts on transparent, transparency, government, media, citizens' involvement, and also the very interesting niche of uh, voter psychology or psychology of election and how some of these topics could influence the voters' uh, decision to engage with their government. Yeah. So where do we take this now, Councilman Hamlin? Scott, what do you want to do to start some of well, the things? Uh, we I'll let you kick off where you want to go, but I think um, you know the, the logical thing to do would be to uh, kind of take in a little what he said and um you know look a little reflection of ourselves and see you know kind of how we test out and when it comes to this uh transparency issue absolutely and that was the main reason that we had dr miller here was that it, again like i'm hoping that some of the future uh, conversation series that we have we could define the question that we are trying to answer within a uh, parameters of academia and you know people in the field who do this for their life so to speak and then we could look at our beloved uh, overland park to see how well it matches or even what model do we have it doesn't need to match exactly what uh, you know is out there but how are we doing in that regards and if i may i wanted to share my screen for a second this is a uh, basically a uh, a slide from Open Democracy, which is a citizen-oriented uh, uh, entity in France. And basically, uh, I just came to, 
to see this uh, about 20 minutes ago when I was reading on some stuff. And you could be basically see that an open government is defined here by participation, collaboration, and transparency. And the transparency and the participation of the public is essentially two of the most important legs of an open government, which leads to a collaborative effort between the government and the people to make their lives better, so to speak. I just want to thought that if, you, if anybody is interested to go and read this, I will put the link, but it's from Open Democracy Association in, in France. And then it defines all other things. How do you consult with citizens, educate citizens, monitor policies so they still are open and uh, transparent. Uh, it even goes after uh, how do you transform structures inside the government in a way that it becomes more open. So it's rather an interesting uh, uh, information that I, I found and I will put the link on the web. But one of the, one of the topics I wanted to explain right now is the issue, in my opinion, that we have with composition of the committees at the city of Overland Park. So before we get to Overland Park, one more time, Dr. Miller's presence here was just as an academician. We are not, you know, we did not engage to any conversation about OP with, with Dr. Miller. But now we are going to talk about OP. That's our business. So Overland Park basically acts on four different committees, uh, public works, public safety, finance administration, and community development. So you think it would be completely natural based on the model of an open government that descending point of views would get a representation on the most important committee of these four, not that saying the others are not important, but the committee under the brand finance and administration, because that's the committee that controls the finances of the city of Overland Park. So one of the issues that uh, we have had is that basically this committee is always designed by the mayor in a shape that only represents one side of the argument. I am sure the reviewers of this program are well aware of our uh, position against tax giveaways uh, when the projects don't deserve it for areas that are not blighted. This, you know, handing over millions of dollars in taxes, which has caused to this shortfall of the budget that we are experiencing right now. So no matter if our opinion about stopping this hemorrhage, stopping these tax giveaways, and preserving these dollars to put it in city services, so we don't have to cut the majority of our public services right now in the middle of a pandemic. So we would have enough reservoirs to pass through a pandemic like this. Doesn't matter if you believe that we were right or wrong, it would be logical to have a representation from our point of view, which is supported by at least a portion of voters who voted for us, who voted for Councilman Hamblin, who voted for me, who voted for former council member Gina Burke. We would have a representation there. I have been on the council for since uh, <clears throat> 2017, and we basically have never had a chance that a descending point of view would get a opportunity to essentially express what uh, a different point of view is going to be there. Uh, we just saw Dr. Miller saying that the discussion is the minimum we could do. A discussion is the minimum we could do. So if you constantly design these committees in a protectionist way, and my focus is on finance administration, which approves millions of dollars given away to a lot of multi-hundred million dollar corporations. If it's constantly protected from a descending point of view, from the, if you want to call it opposition, then that is a significant problem in terms of transparency and open government. So what do you think, Scott, in that regard? Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And if you were to look at it historically, um, and you look at the, the, the historic governing body of Overland Park, you would probably conclude that the finance administration was maybe comprised of, of some of the more senior members. Um, but it's become clear 
in in uh, here recently that that's not necessarily the case um, because now it's you know in my opinion uh, the committee assignments are being done in more of a you know we're looking for people that think this way and want to spend the money this way and um, you know for instance I mean correct me if I'm wrong Dr. Farisada but there is there not one or two or someone you know on on the finance committee that's got less time uh, in elected office than you do absolutely and if it was by if it was by seniority as you say if it it used to be it should have been a different composition even when uh, former council member Burke was on the council and I'm on the council but right you are absolutely right we were even being told at some point unofficially that this is a place that when we were junior, I mean, or more junior than what, what we are, that well, the ones who have more experience are gonna be significantly more fitting because they have been doing this for a longer point of time, which I don't subscribe to necessarily. I think it should be a reflection of what people of Overland Park are saying in terms of using their tax dollars. But now, suddenly that goalpost has been moved and you suddenly have very junior members with limited, significantly limited experience in in that are now basically uh, deciding on major, major uh, financially uh, important decisions, which you know you would think that uh, there would be a, re a way, a place for us at least as the elected officials to voice our opinion. Never, and at this point, if I cannot voice my opinion, then you know, uh, God save a average citizen who wants to come and express his point of view basically so yeah. i mean if, if we wanted to truly represent uh the the people and the different opinions out there in the public then we would make our committees assignments based off um you know people with differing opinions but that 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 that's not the case the, the committee assignments especially when you're talking about something as is in, as important as is fed the finance administration it's it's com, it's become comprised more of people that they know the outcome of their decisions um before they even have to present it so yeah. you know you can you can watch those meetings and you're not going to see any debate um because they've designed it that way yeah and it's and you have a few of them on your Facebook, which you basically absolutely do not see that much of a due diligence happening on an item. You hear the same questions repeated, the same answers, cliche answers given back, and then you don't find a critical analysis and the decision over is over millions of dollars. It's simply over millions of dollars. Now, Scott, if you agree with me, let's zoom it to one level lower than that. And that is when the citizens come in front of the council and express their point of view. Number one, they, as you are well aware, the city of Overland Park didn't have what we call public comments or open microphone for a long time. Many of the uh, adjacent cities and the counties have that and had that and have been enjoying it. Last year, August, I proposed that officially that we need a period of public comments for 30 minutes that people would come and would talk to their lawmakers free of any stress and they would, the microphones would be there. And you supported it significantly through your campaign and also later on when you were elected. Now, <clears throat> first of all, from last August, it was first uh, uh, kind of uh, suggested that it would be done in November. That never happened. It wasn't done in November. And then what happened was that uh, finally, about a month and a half ago, uh, it got approved after a lot of pressure and after a lot of, you know, back and forth. But right now, it's still not happening. They, the mayor does not want to have it on Zoom meetings, which amazes me why we are not going to have public comments on Zoom meetings, especially right now with the recent developments that is happening. And then we continue with the same format, and now it's pushed back to September. What's your take on that, on the necessity of that? Or well, to answer those in reverse order, um, yeah, I think it's a little absurd that 
we've come up, you know, everyone's agreed on this policy. Granted, and I'll get to that next, that it was it was an election time uh, kind of pressure item. Um, but the um, um, we are having public comments. We've had public comments on on specific issues. So, for instance, a couple meetings ago, we had a pretty contentious zone rezoning issue, and we had public comments public hearings uh, yeah public, public hearings, hearings they call it yeah. public hearing so so it works it, the system works it allows it, it it can be done um going even further back um yeah there was um there was more support than ever um prior to the elections for um this open comment period um, it kind of became a, an election topic along, you know, and, and so you saw a, th a few things happen. You saw some movement for once. You saw um, some discussion about the public comments period. My opinion is that, it, you know, it was not something anybody wanted to stand against, but I didn't see the real action and thrill to go after it. That's why we still haven't implemented it. That's why there's been so much talk. We put it at the end of the meeting and make people sign up a week in advance you know, uh, making it more difficult than, than anybody else or it really has to be. Um, but you saw that, you saw the same thing with the non-discrimination ordinance. That, that became a huge uh, uh, election deal, Overland Park, and, you know, virtually, you know, in my recollection, almost all of the council stood firmly against that. I mean, their, their policy was, that's not our issue, that's a federal issue, which is fine, that's their opinion. And then when it became an election issue, just like that, they, they, they flipped and they approved it because they wanted that off the table uh, when it came voting day. So, you know, it, it, it was kind of something that happened, uh, you know, I think it was election pressure that, that pushed that through a little bit and that's why we still don't see it. Uh, the we uh, just uh, Dr. Miller was expressing that a lot of decision makings happens in the committees, <coughs> just like the state government. And we proposed this. Uh, I wanted it to be done for council and the committee. Back in August, I proposed that to be public comments, thirty minutes for city council and the committees, at least fifteen minutes. They didn't approve the committees, so people still can't voice their opinion freely. At the committees, it's at the, uh, at the discretion of the chair. And then I give you a one very good example how that is now at some level suffocating the people's voice right now. We have an issue on community development committee, which is about rental license fees. So rental license fees, to my amazement, in the city of Overland Park are structured in a way that is per building. So if you have 120 units in one building, you pay one fee, for example, 100 bucks or $120. And then if you are a person who has three single apartments in three different buildings, you pay three times 100 bucks. <laughs> so essentially, if you are lucky enough to ha have a multi-hundred million dollar building, which you will collect 120,000, 150,000 dollars a month, you will pay less fees than a person who has two, three apartments for rent and collects maybe three, four thousand dollars a month. So it absolutely doesn't make sense. It's absolutely bananas in my opinion. Yeah. From two months ago, I am trying to bring this up in the community development and the chair is blocking it. And, it, and now, if we had the public comments, maybe some people could come and talk about this. This is about a small business landlords versus big business landlords. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and here is a good example where the chair is blocking it, people can't talk about it, and they resist a discussion. They keep pushing it back and saying that the yearly review, we're going to talk about it. And yeah, like that. and and that and that's one of the things that that causes a problem. Like you heard him saying, like we all know, a lot, most of the business does get handled at the committee level. So you'll see this stuff come in front of the council, and it will say, well, it was pro approved unanimously by the committee, and a lot of the members will say, well, okay, then it must 
be great. Well, the problem is, and I, you know, I've even heard like, you know, the mayor say, did you address this at committee? Because that's where it should be addressed. Well, it wasn't allowed, um, you know, so it, it, it's kind of, you know, the, the committee is an extremely important place as they will tell you themselves. That's where a lot of the business gets taken care of. So logically, that's where a lot of public input should be also. So, you know, to not include that uh, public comment period in committee, we're missing a huge opportunity to take input from the public at the time that it matters um, before it gets pushed on to the council. Because we all know, you know, it, it's, if something comes to the council with an overwhelming committee support, it's got a much greater chance of passing. Um, so it would be much better to have that discussion, you know, at the committee level instead of trying to overturn the committee at the council level. So, um, you know, that's great. It's just, Scott, it's just can you please enlighten us about the recent cancellation on public safety? Oh, yeah, and you worked on two items and you are on the public safety, police pay, and also this story, and then boom, you know, <laughs> yeah. public safety is our so, so the most recent one is, which, you know, a lot of people I'm sure I've heard about is, and related directly to, to transparency is, we had a, an issue, most people are probably aware of the 17 year old um, that was shot and killed by, um, by a police officer here in 2018. And um, there were some statements made at the time um, that don't match some of the statements that are being clarified now. Um, so there's a lot of residents, there's a lot of demand for transparency and people want to come express their opinions. And the logical place to them and really probably for anyone would be to come to public safety. Public safety handles fire and police. Um, so we had a lot of residents planning on on coming and telling their opinion you know asking for transparency asking for us to uh you know get together whether it be publicly or privately and come up with a unified statement to clarify just what happened here um what where, where's the miscommunication why does the public feel misled um and uh so that would have taken place on wednesday um but that uh, public safety meeting was canceled uh, um, and due to well several things at first it you know it the, the agenda came out and said it was due to lack of items on the agenda we were later told that uh, well we were scheduled the public safety instead of doing the people's business we were going to go through uh, they were going to send us through a bias training class um, it just happened to coincide at the exact same time as a public safety meeting. So we were going to do that instead. But unfortunately, that got canceled at the last minute. So uh, we couldn't have our public safety meeting. I mean, you know, that's, is, is that your recollection of pretty much how it all happened there? It, it, is, it is, it is. And also, we just, you know, it's, again, like, uh, just like you said, this is business that we signed in and we have to do. And then if we cancel it, then we are not doing our job. A month and a half ago, there were, we had an item about hazard pay for first responders. Again, public was very interested. They were actually very supportive of hazard pay for first responders. And at that time, the public safety got canceled by Mayor Gerlach again. No consultation. I was on the committee. I was the vice chair of the committee. Nobody consulted with me. Nobody told me we're going to cancel the public safety meeting. And I suddenly see a letter saying that mayor took the... It, he even went over basically the chair of the uh, committee. So again, at the hot topic that people are interested, they are talking about hazard pay for first responders, the committee answering to that is canceled. Now, people are asking for transparency about what happened during this, the, in the outcome of this shooting death of this, uh, this individual, how did the city handle it? Where did, why did they pay X amount of dollars to whom? to the officer and all of those conversations. And then again, we get numbers of email at the government saying that we want to come to public safety and talk about it and the committee is canceled. So yeah. that, that is, again, if, it's, these, if these are some sort of at will get togethers that may or may not happen based on 
how do we feel about a discussion, about being open, about being transparent, then maybe we should get the notice that, you know, kind of, they're kind of casual. They're not. And kind of to tag on to that a little bit more, um, it didn't quite end there, believe it or not, with the hazard pay. It, um, it ended up uh, being uh, put off by the public safety chair onto a different committee. So it, it eventually, about two months after we proposed it, was <laughs> finally heard by the finance committee. We specifically requested that the public be allowed to speak. I mean, um, uh, there were lots of people that wanted to come speak about it and just flat out told, no, they're not going to be allowed to speak at this meeting. Yeah. Um, Including so, the family of late officer Scott Mosher, who sacrificed his life only a few weeks ago for protecting the people of Overland Park. And that's, that was very saddening to me that this family is hold in highest regard as they should be two weeks earlier. And now two weeks later, when they want to come and talk to their government, they are being told no. That is, is just, just amazing to me. Amazing to me. Uh, the, uh, another interesting thing is that the chair of the public safety committee right now put us, did not hesitate to say that I did not feel like I wanted to let the public safety committee to go forward for us to just come and listen to the citizens. I didn't feel like we should come there and just listen to a bunch of people talking, which essentially tells me that the definition of representation, as Dr. Miller was mentioning, he said representation is a back and forth. The meaning of representation is a back and forth discussion. I think the chair of public safety needs to re-educate himself in terms of the definition of representation. If right. you do not feel <laughs> like you should get together so people could come and express their point of view for this very important time and a very important reason, of the transparency of what happened, I want to know what happened with my tax dollars and stuff, then when will you feel mandated to let people talk? Yeah, I mean, he, he, he said it well. He said, you know, uh, an example of transparency would fall on the elected officials to exactly like you said, have a back and forth. You get contacted, you don't have to agree, but you respond and you explain your position. Um, we even offered them the opportunity that we'll just listen. Okay, and you know, only accomplish half of 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 what we just heard um, Dr. Miller talk about. Um, but even that was denied. So you know, not only did we not accomplish half, we accomplished zero of uh, of what I would say our duties as elected officials would be. So where do we go with uh, basically the? Uh, the relationship with the media, in your opinion, like how do we titrate ourselves in terms of how do we deal with the media? And, the, you know, uh, that maybe is a question for the members of the media, but I wanted to get your point of view in terms of how clearly, first of all, we have two angles at this. One is our public relations department, the way that they transfer the opinion out there to the governing body by, you know, trying to provide us with clips of the news and things like that. Second thing is that how do we communicate our position to the media out there, either the you know, newspapers, TVs, and stuff like that. What is, what is your take on that? How, how transparent we are in that, in that regard? Well, I think, I think it's our duty to be transparent in that. It's um, like you mentioned, the, the city has a PR department. Well, the the comments they make to the media the statements the whatever they tell the media is going to be based off what uh, city management what what the mayors told them they need to say what the majority of the body says um and if it can't speak for you it can't speak for you the media is a form of communication just another form of communication with your constituents so um yeah i mean if 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 you have a differing opinion and you get a call from the media and they want to know your opinion. I, yes, I think uh, absolutely there is, you know, some call it planned politics, I, you know, well, okay, call it that what you want, but that's me communicating my opinion um, to, to my constituents. Maybe I didn't agree with the decision and 
the statement that the city that the city PR put out doesn't apply to me. Well, I I think I need to let that be known. I mean, that's that's just that's part of the nature of the job. There's gonna be media. They're gonna ask you questions, and all we can do is be transparent and honest with them. Um, anything less be a disservice. There was a time, uh, Scott. Majority of it probably before that. We were constantly being instructed that if the media reached you, hand it over to our public relations department. Right. And I yeah. had a real difficult, did you get any of those emails? I had a really yeah. difficult yeah. issue with that. Oh yeah, me too. I mean, that, that's something, you know, if, if you have an employer and your, and, and your employer has a PR department and had you, you know, under their rules, under your contract, whatever, that you won't speak to the media, so be it. But that's, that's, not, that's not our function. Um, it it is, to, is, is to function just, just like an employee. We're an elected official by the people. We, you know, we have to let our opinion know. So for us just to, uh, like, I, like I said earlier, for us just to forward things on to the PR department and let them speak for something we don't believe is, is, a, is a disservice. It's not transparent. It's not telling people what our opinion is. Um, some people m may love what the city said and, and completely dislike what we said, but it's still uh, our, our responsibility in the nature of transparency to let people know, you know, no, I didn't vote for that and here's why. Um, I don't agree with that and here's why. It's um, you know, it's unreasonable to have a body of 12 elected officials from uh, different areas of the city agree on absolutely everything and put out one unified statement. That's unreasonable. Um, and so just the notion that that's how we should operate is, I mean, it's, a, it's an old status quo mindset that, you know, we're a board of directors for a uh, a corporation and we don't want to see our stock tank or something. I mean, it just, it's just unreasonable. We have, we had recently uh, former council member Burke stepped down and there was a committee put together to appoint, according to the city ordinances, appoint somebody in her behalf. Now, and that uh, broadcast is available public about the interviews that that committee had with the different candidates. It was interesting that what you said was said by the mayor. We are a board of director kind of structure. Right. Yeah. No, we are not. Yeah. We are not board uh, of directors. We yeah. are a number of elected officials who represent 200,000 people. The board of director pursues one philosophy and that is the well-being of that company and steps over anything else which comes across his path. Right. Okay, a population, a 200,000, the second most populous the city of the Overland Park is not a homogenous group of people who have given a mandate to a board. There is a number of different opinions. There is a number of different views. There are, you know, very challenging uh, points of view and they need to be represented. So looking at yourself and after being the mayor for like, I don't know, 15 years or something, and some of these respected colleagues of ours being there for 15, 16, 12 years and defining yourself as a board member, to me is absolutely amazing. Oh yeah. Um, and you, you talk about the, the interview process and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty we can talk about with that interview process, but one of the most shocking things, and, and since we're, we're, talking about how people describe themselves and a little bit about the mayor. One of the most shocking things to me um, that I heard during that whole process was we actually had one of the candidates and I don't, I don't think it was one that was selected. I, I don't recall. Um, at the end of the interview, they said, you got any questions for us? And this candidate said, uh, you know, actually I do, Mr. Mayor, uh, what is your opinion of a perfect city council member? And his response was, well, it would be somebody that when they find themselves voting in the minority, they go back and do more research and figure out what they had wrong. <laughs> I 
I mean, that's just absolutely a mind boggling thought that if you vote in the minority and you don't agree with the status quo or me, then you need to go do your homework because you're wrong. I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I don't even know what to, I don't even know what to say to that. By that definition, America would never come to exist essentially. No. Because, you know, basically, we should just uh, have agreed with uh, the British Empire and <laughs> figured out that becoming yeah, an right. independent country was a wrong thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the day a unified statement was put out from the Senate, the Congress, and the uh, White House, uh, I think that'd be a little eerie for everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, th these are really, you know, again, I respect people who want to serve the public, but you just really need to look into what you are saying at the end of the day. And if that is going to, if that ideology is going to drive your practice, then you want to find yourself very much in front of the, a lot of people. I remember the reason that uh, I proposed the open public comment, open microphone thing was that one day over this issue of uh, what is referred to as Santa Fe Park, or right now it's called Thompson Park. We have a we had a Air Force veteran who came to talk about it, and people were had concerns. Simply, they had concerns. They wanted a gazebo uh, saved there. They wanted to have an input in the design and the structure of the new park and everything like that. And essentially, he was about to be told to leave by the mayor because. The man was talking, there was no time for a public comment, but they had concerns and they ran out of patience and he started talking that I'm a citizen, I'm a constituent, I wanna talk. And he was about to be instructed or even a little bit later, perhaps uh, asked very strongly to leave because he wanted to talk about his park. A park that was being built by his tax money to the tunes of $4.2 million for a couple acre of worth of park. So, you know, if you don't have enough patience to even listen to somebody talking about a park to you, how much you're gonna talk and you're gonna receive an opinion about a multi hundred million dollar tax giveaway that you are approving when loads of people come in front of you. I'm talking about brokerage right now. Right. Yeah. Over five years of constant people objecting to it of course, you're going to go ahead just like the mayor did and veto the rejection of that tax giveaway and hand over $200 million to a developer, essentially. Of course, you're going to do that as it happened. Yeah. Overwhelming public support against it. Um, odd way of saying that, but uh, overwhelming, the public did not want it. The city council did not want it. The city council... Uh, did not approve it. It was it was vetoed uh, by the mayor. So, you know, um, that was a, a very very upsetting ordeal to a lot of people. Now, here is I want to take another angle and ask you a question about that. So, we have a city manager. Again, my point here is not to talk about anybody in person. We're just talking about positions, and that city manager is in this structure, is allowed to make any decision he likes about the whole staff, 1,200 people is it, in Overland Park that we employ. And we are being told, it's on record, that you absolutely have zero mandate to make inquiry or wanna get in that business. How can we deliver our duties as elected officials? in terms of providing quality services to a 200,000 people city, if the only person, there is only one person who makes decision about the staff, and that is it, and he's the sole authority. Our city services are delivered to these people by the staff of the city that we spend in, you know, over a hundred million dollars in, uh, in their budget. And now, we are being told that it's only city manager. He doesn't need to consult with you. He doesn't need to listen to you even. And a perfect example of it of was the cut in the first responders pay 
that they directly communicated with you. And we as the council members had no idea that this is happening to a huge number of our staff, all of our staff, and especially our city responders. How can, how can we deliver our duties if we can't listen to our staff or we can't bring an issue about a staff satisfaction and we are basically stonewalled by a position named uh, city manager? Yeah, I mean, there, when we're not even informed and when we're told that we as council members have no voice, we can't, it's that simple. Um, you know, in, in that situation, it was one where the employees came to us and asked us for help. Um, and so we did, we did our best, but even deeper than that, um, it, it, it goes beyond that. So when we have the city manager set up that we have now, so the way they've set the job description for our city manager is that he's responsible for day-to-day -day duties. Okay. So the problem with that is the interpretation of that. And that gets interpreted, in, interpreted differently every single time. And, and just to give you an example of the craziest one I've seen, and, you know, it's not, there was a lot of people upset about it, but, it, you know, we're not talking about staff or something here. But so I was on community development here um, a few months ago, and we were deciding on whether we were going to open the pools or not. Okay. Um, so what had happened uh, I expected to go into this community development meeting and sit down with a blank sheet of paper and discuss with the other committee members what we were going to do. We had a million and a million fifty to spend on pools. Um, what were we going to do? Were we going to open one, two, none? Who knows, right? Well, we go in and the decision had been made. We have five uh, outdoor public pools and one indoor public pool at the Matt Ross Center. So when we got to the meeting, it had already been decided by the city manager that four of the five outdoor pools were going to not open and be closed. Um, the Matt Ross, the indoor one was going to open and the decision left for the community development was whether open, whether or not to open one pool. So, and that's, and that goes to what I'm saying about the interpretation, the interpretation of what day to day um, decisions are is an issue in my opinion because you know it, it, I have yet to receive a uh, acceptable explanation of how closing four pools opening one and leaving one other up to the council is uh, fits into the narrative of data of day-to-day decisions i mean what that that mixture of uh interpretation just kind of you know blows my mind a little bit of uh and of, for something as hot as pool topic right. this summer yeah this yeah, summer that, so is, yeah. that is one of the issues since i've been on that i've got the most communication about was the uh natural opening of the public pools so essentially you go to this meeting and the decision is 75% made for you, basically. Oh, absolutely, and, more net. I mean, it was, you know, we decided if we were gonna open one, and so I guess day-to-day -day decisions, uh, you know, four, four of the pools were a day-to-day, -day, no, five of the pools were a day-to-day -day decision, but one I wasn't. Often. <laughs> I don't and know. It, so. it goes like, you know, when we had this issue over first responders pay adjustment, constantly we were told that you're stepping out of your uh, realm of authority because it's in the purview of city manager. We are essentially saying that half of the city budget, almost half of the city budget, which is the operating budget, is outside, is almost outside the realm of uh, city council uh, elected officials and one person is, has the authority because majority of it deals with uh, compensation. So to speak, which if my constituents are aware of that, I do not believe that that's the structure that they, they want to have because then I cannot represent them in that, in that regard. I am, I'm without any avenue. And that's actually what happened. The mayor, again, topic of transparency, we wanted discussion items. The mayor blocked it, would not allow discussion item send it down to the committee for the first responders pay 
and it got denied there. And the conversation was still over the fact that it's in the purview of the city manager and you shouldn't even discuss it. Right. Let me see. Uh, we are, I think we're almost getting clo close to the end, but uh, so where do you think, uh, the question you asked from Dr. Miller, I'm going to ask from you actually. So, Scott, what should we do? Like, what is, I and you are constantly told that we are acting political, which I don't understand what's the meaning of it, you know, what the true meaning of it. We ask questions. We just heard Dr. Miller said, you know, the least you could do is to enter to a discussion. We constantly try to get to the discussion. We are not, we, we are denied. And obviously we just continue what is right to do. But uh, what is the role for the voter? What is the role for somebody who is listening to this to engage and make it a better future in terms of their participation and basically forcing Overland Park to be more transparent. I, I guess what I'm asking you is that, how can an average voter who is listening to this, how can they impose more transparency on Overland Park and demand more transparency in terms of their voice being heard, in terms of the decisions being cleared, in terms of the discussion back and forth, which one more time was defined as the true meaning of representation to basically flow. What do you think an average person could do? Well, I mean, the, the, the common response you always hear is contact your councilman. Uh, I'd love to tell you that that works. Um, but I think there's a I lot think of you cases. won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cases, it, 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 you know, I, I hate to admit it, it's probably not. So, you know, the, about the biggest thing you can do is pay attention. Pay attention to what, to, to uh, you know, pay attention to who's the council members in your own ward. Who do you get to vote for? And then you look at them and like uh, Dr. Miller said, how many of them have a social media presence? How many of them are doing town hall meetings? How many of them are... Um, communicating issues uh, through Facebook Live, like a situation like this. Um, you know, just how active are they in communicating with the public? And how much do you believe that they act on the public's behalf versus how much do you think they um, are, are valuing maybe um, a lobbyist or um, the mayor's opinion or somebody else's over yours. So I think that's the biggest thing you can do. Um, you know, there's, there's some status quo uh, members out there that I love to tell you, you can email and hope to see some change. I don't, you know, I, I encourage you to try um, whether that produces results or not. Um, but obviously the biggest thing is to, to, to pay attention. And so next time you go to the polls, you're educated. On, um, on who is um, looking out for you, who's communicating with you, and who's, you know, in it for a different reason. Yeah, and then again, in the spirit of educating the public, remember this November there is no city council election, but next November there is city council election with a number of positions. The, uh, I fully agree with you, I think, we need to pay attention to our local government. Local government is in our face. Indeed, this pandemic brought to the surface the problems that we have mentioned long time ago. That Overland Park is giving away too much, too much to developers and the buffering capacity of it from the financial point of view is not enough. You uh, very uh, accurately mentioned that in in uh, 2007 or 2008, Overland Park had 90 something million dollars in reserve funds. And in 2020, it has half of that. That's absolutely amazing that you grow your population, you grow your demand, things get more expensive, but you find yourself with your saving account being half of what it was in 2008. And you, yeah. then you think you can pass through this pandemic? No, you can't. Yeah, All of the programs that we have in Overland Park, public services, all of them are cut. 
all of the maintenance programs that we have, when I say all, good majority of it, you know, basically. They have to be cut, it's on public records when we are talking about the budget. It's, you have to cut your, the salary of your staff, your first responders. You have to let for, for low every part-time person who was working, working for you. Just very rough decisions. And I remember that you were telling them that before the pandemic that this is the last year of the recession. It's just the corona pushed it forward, basically. Right. This day was upon us one way or the other when a recession would hit. And we didn't prepare for it because, I repeat this number, in the last six years, we gave away a billion dollars, a billion dollars in tax money to the developers. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with development. There is nothing wrong with, you know, responsible, financially responsible and reasonable development. I don't even have a problem with handing over some level of relief to a blighted area. We just simply don't have blighted areas in Overland Park. But when you write off a billion dollars in the last six years, we say it and some of them laugh at us, but the numbers are right there. The numbers are there. Well, Among and, the and, and, and the, I was going to say the, the, the thing you'll hear constantly repeated over and over again as well, you know, <laughs> if we don't do it, it won't develop. Well, here we sit in, in Johnson County, especially when you're talking about this Southern portion, you know, like Ward 5 and 6 that uh, Dr. Ferris Saudi and I are in. Um, we're sitting on some of the most valuable land in the metro area. I mean, businesses are going to want to operate here. So this notion that if we don't pay them and let them build without property taxes and if we don't give them all this, no development's going to happen. That's, that's absurd. That's, um, that, that's just, it, it's simply not the case. And not only that, I think we have, I think we, we, we're at a point where we can probably say, okay, we tried. You know, what are we, we're on 15 years now of this administration. And in the, the entire time it's been, we're investing, we're investing, we're investing. Well, now here we sit in an absolute financial crisis. Um, I've asked numerous times, when are our investments going to pay? <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's, it's like if you're looking to retire, you want to look and you want to be able to look at the, you know, talk to an investment advisor and say, when can I retire? Well, that, you know, that, that's kind of what we're looking at here. It's like, when, when are our investments going to pay off? Um, because here we are in a financial crisis. Uh, you know, when do you intend to, you know, for us to be flush because of all these fantastic decisions we made. We're, you know, so the experiment has ran for 15 years and here we sit in a crisis. So I don't know. Overland Park, according to them, is really dependent on sales tax exemption. I'm sorry, on sales taxes. We brought, I and you brought a proposal that we stop giving away these sales taxes to developers for the next budget cycle. We are in absolute shambles. Oak Park Mark was closed. Pandemic all over the place. You have to let go of your employees. You can't put together money for the parks. You don't have, you have to stop a bunch of projects. Okay, at least stop sales tax exemption for apartment builders. Simple fact. And you know, when you look at how much money they give out, that's also not a lot of money like, you know, but for us, it's a lot of money. A $100 million apartment project might only pay 4 or $5 million in sales tax for the material. That may not be a lot to them. It's not. And for us, it's a lot. In the middle of this pandemic, they rejected that. No, we have to continue this. Again, a couple of weeks, what was it? A month ago, we brought this tax giveaway for this multi-billion dollar company, Creative Planning, 435 and all worth of $6 million package. We told them this is not the right time to do it. We are in the middle of a pandemic. No, it has to be approved. If we don't give the taxes away, nobody wants to make a square foot in Overland Park. And again, when we talk about this office, this transparency issue, misinforming your uh, audience and not fully disclosing the ramifications of your decisions is in my opinion also an issue with transparency. 
It is misinforming right. when you say that I didn't give any taxes away. These are the tax dollars that we never collected. That's misinformation in my opinion. Right. And the results of it are bubbling to the surface right now. Right now in front of our eyes in Overland Park. I had a call from a constituent yesterday, extremely unhappy why you guys apply two different standards in a street maintenance between me and my neighboring uh, subdivision. And that was new to me. And I'm like, oh my God, like, what is it? We looked into it and he was looking into Leewood. <laughs> that was the neighboring subdivision was in Leewood. So he was like, I don't understand what, why are you doing double standards? And I had to be embarrassed and tell him that, no, I'm sorry, that's Leewood. That's not overnight, but trust me. <laughs> we do the same chip seal all over here. So right. people want to know. People want to know why I can't have the quality of uh, surface maintenance, such as my neighboring city. Right. Well, that's that, that kind of of everything comes back to dollars. Yeah, and it, it ties into what I said about this 15-year experiment is, is public service has gone down, 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 down. You know, we're, we're chip seal roads. Well, look at here in the, in what, the past week, uh, I believe you were on community development and you had to fight to keep, uh, what does they call it, bulk, big item trash pickup day? Yeah, the big item um, pickup. Yeah, because, because, because they didn't, they were a point of view that $150,000 is too much to do this service for the people. Yeah, so like you said, we're, we're, we're still, you know, giving away $6 million to a multi-billion dollar company but we're trying to take a service that the public, you know, benefits from, really enjoys, like the bulk item pickup, and and cut it out because it's one hundred fifty thousand. And it's not just that; we've seen numerous things of hundred thousand dollars or less. We're just cut, 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 cut. Um, and granted, the majority of the public probably doesn't see it yet. Um, you know, obviously we're more in tune. We see this stuff happening, but, but they will. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's going to, I mean. It will be there. And again, yeah. when you have your constituents come talk to you and you are not being transparent with them, either you don't let them talk or you, and then your elected officials want to put a discussion item and you block it, then this leads that you continue whatever you have been doing and when we say transparency helps a government to function, is that it provides you a chance to correct yourself. And when you block that opportunity from yourself to receive input, to discuss an input, to look into the evidence about an input, then you get this to this position that you are in 2020, a pandemic has hit, you don't have money and you still insist on old fashioned philosophies that you had 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You right. still are talking about private public partnership and your piece of partnership will never come to rescue you. Basically. Right. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're still wanting to uh, highly fund, you know, retail. Um, and you know, still, we are, we, the, the sky is falling because Oak Park Mark is, is closed. It, yeah. If you are not going to be straightforward with your constituents, then you continue bad decisions. I do not buy and subscribe that the financial health of Overland Park was completely dependent on Oak Park Mall. Right? And no. we know malls are a breeding species, they are, are a dying species. They are well, they don't survive anywhere. Right, and, and that's part of it. I mean, the, the, the issue with uh, Overland Park, I mean, we, yes, we set it up to be um, a city that relied more heavily on sales tax than than any other probably city in the metro um but that's come under scrutiny for the past two or three years it's been discussed it's 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 been worrisome i mean the the like the online you know online shopping has you know rendered that most likely a probably ill-advised decision whenever it was made um and now, you know, we're, we're, we're going to say, oh, Oak Park Mall's closed and we had this shutdown so we couldn't collect sales tax. So now it's an issue. Well, anybody that wants to go back and watch finance committee meetings over the last two years, every one of them is, what are we going to do? We, you know, sales tax is plummeting. 
um, because everyone's shopping online and that's our form of income. Do we need to raise property taxes? I mean, this is not a new topic. Yeah. And we had to fight off an increase in the property tax only a couple of days ago to right. a new unit, uh, the CIT unit in the, for the, for the police department. And again, once again, I told them like, you have a lot of places you could fund this, this unit. You have a lot of opportunities to stop this hemorrhage. And I believe you were on the same track. And in the middle of this pandemic, if we start the Pandora box of raising the property tax, uh, where is it gonna end, basically? What yeah. is the next? And uh, I'm glad that that didn't pass, but if you, bottom line, simple math, if you give your tax dollars away based on some illusions, this is gonna come back to you. And I would not be surprised if the conversation over raising property tax gains momentum in Overland Park. Oh, it, 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 I mean, it will. I mean, they, they're gonna the push for it. You know, the, the, but like you said, it just, there's a lot of other places you, you could deal with it. I mean, you, you can't continue the failed experiment and raise property taxes to cover it. That's just, you can't do that. Um, I mean, they may try, but um, you know, the, the residents that know better are not gonna like to see that, uh, uh, see that happen. And you know, it's something from my perspective that would be extraordinarily hard to support. The financial model of Overland Park is obsolete. It has not paid back. The fruits that we were promised never delivered. They, what we call TIF in general, although it's, a, it's not an accurate term, but these tax giveaways have, in my opinion, brought Overland Park almost to its knees. Uh, you know, look at your street, look at your, the rest of the issues that we are facing, what the media has supported, and we need a revision of it. And that revision cannot be raise mill levy, raise tax right. yeah. immediately. Like, again, if a patient is losing blood, you have to stop that hemorrhage. You can't just you know, basically inject blood when he's losing blood. So you have to stop that hemorrhage, number one, and the hemorrhage that we are facing to the tunes of a billion dollars in six years and the portion of Overland Park from that billion dollar is something that we need to look upon. Uh, Anything else, Councilman? Any other thing you wanted to mention? Something left to talk about? No, I think I think we yes. hit a lot of it. I mean, you know, we took up some of the beginning with that. Uh, what I thought was an interesting interview with uh, Dr. Miller. So, you know, in the uh, sake of not going and to a small amount of time here, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think you agree with me that the lack of transparency, the lack of willingness to accept input from the public, from a simple thing like a gazebo in a park to a big thing like a $200 million tax giveaway for a bunch of luxury apartments and offices. That mm -hmm. problem is carrying us to this area that we don't listen and we insist on obsolete model models. And that right. needs a revision. Yeah. No, there, I mean, there, there's a lot of animosity out there that, the, that, the, that, that, that this council is, is not looking out for their interests. And, and uh, you know, I can sympathize with that when, when, when we see those things. Sir, I thank you for your time on a Saturday evening. And if there is not... Anything else you wanted to discuss? We're going to conclude this installment and, and we're going to go for the next one hopefully soon. Anything else, Councilman? That's it. I, I appreciate it. It's always fun to do it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.